ahead and start off uh, just a little bit here. Uh, two things. We have Barbara Mays, who is on, uh, that is as part of our panelists. And then also a guest is Dustin Jordan. And, and Dustin will talk about his forecast for today. So we're going to use all the graphics that we see on the web uh, that are available on the web. So there's quite a bit, but uh, you know, it may not have everything that you've looked at. And we'll try to translate as best as we can. So uh, just off, uh, as a start here, I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit um, as far as the, uh, the conditions for today. And that is we're really dominated by what I would call a June pattern that somehow has managed to sneak into May and is quite persistent over time with literally a ring of fire extending from West Texas all the way up to uh, northern Missouri and into the Ohio Valley and then the mid-Atlantic states. So if anything, it could almost be construed as, as a summer pattern with a subtropical system down here in Florida. So we have a lot of action here. Uh, I know if I've, I looked at several points of interest in in my mind, and uh, I know Barbara has as well. And Dustin, uh, Barbara, uh, I don't know if you have anything to uh, to mention here, at least as far as I'm going. But um, I'll go ahead and cover at least the general area, and then uh, you can talk about your forecast, and I can talk about mine. And Dustin, uh, yeah, then you can talk about yours. Does that sound pretty good? Yeah, sounds yeah, well, great, Tim. Okay, fantastic. So at this point, uh, when we're looking at the large scale uh, with this, you know, what I call a rather uh, large uh, ridge here in the southeast U.S., we have an interesting uh, pattern which involves quite limited shear. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and pull up uh, what I've got here in terms of uh, – Let's just take a look at the large scale, just with the uh, the NAM background analysis field. So can zoom in, and I'll expand this out a little bit. But that's the uh, that's the nature of the ridge. And so we have one, I would say, one departing quasi shortwave trough here in mid levels, going through eastern Kansas, and then another, uh, you know, which be very subtle, but it's actually associated with that yesterday's MCS. Now still kicking here, by the way looking at uh, the lightning and the GO-16 visible imagery uh, moving in uh, from the northwest into Ohio. So we have those two, and then we have the large upper-level system stuck out there in the Intermountain West. So I was looking at this whole area and wondering if there's uh, any interesting points that, that I wanted to pick. And... Of course, I'm not in the vacuum, and all of a sudden, you know, I see I see my feed, and, all, and in there, suddenly there's about 20 entries of SBC. It's just upgraded the mid-Atlantic states to an enhanced risk, and it's that classic corridor look with the northwest flow pattern uh, going down through here. So I decided to take a look at that, just see, you know, is this some place where, hey, is this worth actually putting a point in? So I did that, and, you know, it, it does fit that pattern that I've seen before with East Coast uh, MCSs that travel off. The only question is, can something that forms west of the Appalachians make it over the Appalachians and then uh, spread into the southeast? So I was looking at this, and sure enough, yeah, we do have an old remnant outflow boundary here. Still got active elevated convection on the backside driving it, and lots of instability out ahead, upper 62 points, low 80s, temperatures, and those two points extend also into the east side of the Appalachians. And it was kind of interesting because I saw a paper, uh, this is uh, Matt Parker, students at at NC State, that looked at Appalachian crossers. And, of course, one of the glaring things that they saw was that the instability had to be at least as much or even higher, you know, contiguous here on the east side of the Appalachians. And the cold pool had to be deep enough on the west side to be able to punch over the mountain ridges so that at least some remnant cold pool could make it to impinge on that unsta unstable air on the east side. And that scenario seems to be the case here today. So I was looking at, um, oh my gosh, this, this might be a little bit too early to look at that one, but if I looked at uh, 
the instability here in terms of most unstable cape. Sure enough, as we go into the late afternoon, you can see on the east side. In fact, uh, on the east side, the instability is even somewhat greater than it is on the west side here. And uh, with the enhanced shear along that, a uh, fairly decent stream at 500 millibars crossing uh, the Appalachians, I'm thinking, yeah, this is a pretty good candidate for, for that to happen. So I kept that in mind, uh, and I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, that I uh, took that seriously before looking elsewhere. And honestly, there are other places of interest. Uh, the other one that I was interested in was out here. When I was looking at western Oklahoma yesterday, there was a lot of convection out here. Uh, not kind of quasi-supercellular. There were some areas with, uh, with a decent mesocyclone, including one in southeast Texas Panhandle, just west of Childress, uh, leading to almost zero storm motion, by the way. So there was a lot of flooding in that area, as well as tennis ball size hail. And there was another one in Lipscomb County. So today, though, the shear doesn't look as strong, but the cape appears to be higher and uh, also relatively uncapped by the afternoon. So I was kind of interested in this area because with those steep mid-level lapse rates, uh, that could really uh, light up. And in fact, I don't know if I can pull up those steep lapse rates here, but I can, uh, yeah, on the SPC mezzo. But let's take a look at that. Stand by, Just pulling it up. So I can bring it in. This is what it looks like here. So yeah, very, very large lapse rates in this area. And decent lapse rates in mid-levels also in Ohio, but they also drop off a little bit as you go east. And that was the concern I had with the east, eastern scenario on my part was the somewhat lack of instability. If I, if I looked at this, you could see on, on here that we have uh, the remnants of the backdoor front that came in yesterday. Uh, the front did help uh, accentuate the shear along its southern edge. So there was a supercell that formed west near Manassas, Virginia, and then dropped down to Fredericksburg, dropped some large hail in that region. Uh, that front is uh, a little bit more embedded, but uh, in some areas, the clouds are breaking up. There's no more push behind to uh, drive more cold air in. So the scenario could easily depict the situation where the front dissipates and you get solar heating, but you still have accentuated shear left over. And so that when this cluster comes in, it could actually reorganize on the east slope and utilize that low level shear to help uh, improve the organization of whatever system there is. Uh, if there's any lead storms that develop, yeah, they could uh, turn into supercells before getting swallowed up by the large system coming out west. So, the other uh, situation that I had to worry about was if I looked at the NAM nest out here, and it's not that I'm sold on the NAM nest, but late in the afternoon, it almost shows nothing. What happened out here to the west? When we have a, a cold pool coming in, there's a lot of unstable air. It looks like it's going to go zero cap, and the NAM nest doesn't do anything. So that was a concern. It's like, what is going on? This is not... Uh, the scenario that was being depicted. And I think as we find out later on, when we go to the SRF ensemble, this happens to be uh, neighbor nearest neighbor probability of at least 75 meters square per second squared updraft helicity. And this is from the 12Z uh, HRF. And you can see that there's pretty high probability of significant updraft helicity. And if we did take a look at the probability of max wind gust with the conditional requirement that the wind gusts are associated with some reflectivity, at least 20 TBC. Um, we can see it, in fact, wait until it loads up, and you can see the bullseye coming across the Appalachians into northern Virginia. So it said to me that um, the NAM nest seems to be an outlier. And in fact, if we go to uh, the HER in the afternoon, it was... Uh, depicting a situation where, let's go to the 14 C so we get some hours here. You can see that, yes, the, the ratio does organize. You can see it, it's, it, it keeps it in Pennsylvania until late, and then it accentuates, it, it actually moves it right across the uh, 
the Metro on both sides. So it does blow up. 22Z, I got my point up here roughly right when it does uh, at least enhance itself as it crosses the Appalachians. So this uh, this scenario has been depicted for several runs of the HER, including the HREF. It seems to be a pretty confident solution. So I went for wind in that point. So at this point, uh, Barbara, I don't know. Um, I don't know. You, you didn't pick this point, and I'm not. Uh, I know we were talking about it earlier, uh, but you have a, a chaser mindset, so <laughs> I don't know. I'll let you go ahead and, yeah. and tell me what you were thinking here. And, and if you want any time, I'll, I'll go ahead and transfer the screen to you. Um, yeah, we can transfer over whenever you're ready to wrap yourself up. And, and uh, I think what you were asking me very gently is, Bob, what were you thinking by not going in this area? I don't know. I mean, it's a pretty confident solution. You know, if you go for wind in this place, I mean, I think you're going to score no matter where you are. Yeah, I think, but, you know, I agree. I think that this is a pretty confident solution. Um, it's, a, it's interesting, right? This is a game we're playing, the forecast challenge. And the game is, can I get severe weather? Is there a chance it'll be significant? And I need somebody to report it. Um, because of that game, I don't like picking wind unless it's my last resort because it's very hard to get significant wind reports. Um, so I game it by picking tornado if I can because you get a few extra po points for that. Uh, or if I've got a toss-up between wind and hail, I tend to pick hail because there's an easier chance to get severe hail than there is to get severe wind. So uh, with that mindset and the fact that, yes, I, I do have a little bit of a chaser bias, I started my day looking more in the central United States. And honestly, there were two areas of uh, interest for me, and um, one of them was this this area here setting up across Missouri uh, through the day and another in the upslope flow of Colorado. And uh, so I'm going to start with, uh, I'm using the HER here, 14C HER, just to get a couple of background, um, background parameters. And what I noticed is through the day, uh, we're getting toward 22, 23Z, the flow starts to return to upslope flow into the convergence zone in Colorado there. Uh, there is also a, a good front uh, across Missouri, and still, both of these areas did catch my interest. Um, just throwing the reflectivity on there, since I know we all like to look at that, and it's a pretty easy field to get a first guess. Uh, I noticed that by afternoon, 21, 22Z, a uh, couple of supercells developed in Colorado there in the lee of the Rockies, and also there were uh, some widespread but scattered that's a weird phrase. There were storms developing across Kansas into Missouri. Uh, the coverage of them seemed pretty decent, but um, it, it, I, what I noticed from run to run and among models is a bit of discrepancy on where those might set up, which made me a little nervous. One thing I like about this Colorado-Denver convergence zone is um, just having watched that area through the years, it's a relatively consistent area. Storms kind of develop in the same place. They kind of roll off in the same place. Um, so it makes me feel more confident about picking a point in that area when I can. And uh, just to show some of that consistency, I'll flip over to the NAM nest um, as a next solution. And again, I'll show just the reflectivity to start here. Getting into afternoon, the NAM nest also pretty confident about developing that, that convection off of the uh, convergence zone and rolling it along the I-70 corridor. It also is con pretty confident about convection somewhere from Kansas into Missouri along the, uh, let's say, I-35 to I-70 axis, give or take. Um, so, of course, then you start digging a little deeper. And uh, what I'm actually going to do is a little different of order from Jim. But I'm going to flip to the ensembles next using the HREF and flip through the afternoon and evening again just to get some feel for that confidence of um, where things may be developing. So part of what scares me off of Missouri a little bit is not that I don't think there will be severe weather there, but um, getting a precise point on that to me felt a little bit uh, challenging. With the, you know some models setting up pretty confidently around the say Kansas City metro area, um, others quite a bit further south, um, made me think a little bit more about this Denver convergence zone or where models are relatively consistent, putting some convection up in that zone and and uh, giving a a good spin to it with updraft helicity. The one, uh, here we go. The next field I wanted to look at, the uh, probabilities of four hour max, sorry, these are paintballs of four hours max updraft helicity. Um, 
oh, this is the probabilities. And again, um, I'm going to show this in soundings in just a minute, but at least to draw my eyes on where to highlight those probabilities of a pretty decent updraft helicity become pretty high in that Colorado convergence zone. It makes me think that uh, if something goes up in that area, it does have a pretty good chance to become a rotating updraft and uh, leads me to start thinking about hail or tornado potential in that area. So coming back to a forecast model, I'm going to go to the HER because I like it a little better and really zoom in on this Colorado area. There we go. Uh, a couple of fields I looked at, of course, you just look at updraft helicity swaths and where they all cross is where you put your point, right? Just kidding. But um, much like the, uh, uh, the ensemble forecast, the individual HER runs have been pretty consistently producing uh, rotating supercells in this area. I'd love to be able to grab a snapshot of a HER sounding, but I can't right now. So let's look at a NAM one instead. I'm going to pull it off of pivotal weather for reasons that Jim and I can discuss with you guys in a couple of minutes, actually. Um, right there ahead yeah. of that at zero Z. So go, uh, go ahead, Jim. That was the reason I just realized this, this morning, too, which is kind of fantastic to see. But It is. And I have this other uh, uh, saved here so we can discuss it, Jim. But anyway, looking at this uh, point sounding ahead of the main supercell in, in the NAM nest, at least, You'll see that dew points return into around the 50 degree mark in the model. Uh, one thing I'll point out in the observations, that's about where dew points are right now. So that's implying there's no increase of dew points through the day. Um, as the flow comes around um, with a more easterly component and begins to reach that convergence zone, it's drawing from a source of, let's say, mid 50 dew points, maybe mid to upper 50 dew points. So um, I'd actually feel comfortable that the dew points could come up a couple of degrees and even be a little bit above the 49 or so that's probed here in this particular forecast sounding. I don't think it takes much imagination to see this nice curving photograph off to the right. And while the uh, surface to one kilometer shear is not that great because of that easterly component of the wind, the effective inflow is actually a pretty decent uh, storm elevator of velocity of 192. Surface to three kilometers takes a really big turn because of the uh, turn at the top of the boundary layer here. So all in all, um, again, supporting this potential of, of nice rotating storms. Um, and it puts me in a toss-up between hail and, and tornado in this area. Uh, I've leaned toward tornado over hail for a couple of reasons. One of them is that the mid-level lapse rates here are about 7.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. For that area of the country, to me, that's, uh, it's, it's modest. It's okay, but it's not like great, and it doesn't scream large and giant hail to me. Severe hail, certainly, but um, also just this, this sharp turn from easterly winds to a southwesterly component. Um, knowing that when the dew points get up into the 50s on the high plains and you have upslope flow and you have a rotating storm, it just seems to be able to make magic once in a while and, and produce Tornadoes may be brief and maybe short-lived. I don't expect significant tornadoes for the day, but um, it, at least the, the possibility of there being a tornado to me is, is increased enough that this is where I went, and you'll find my tornado point somewhere near Lyme in Colorado today. So that, what I wanted to highlight and what Jim and I uh, talked about this morning as we were preparing for this is I, I threw up a, uh, a NAM sounding here, or this one from uh, the College of DuPage, and I'm sure a lot of us use College of DuPage when we're making our forecasts just like many of us will use pivotal weather. Uh, we, we don't um, want to admit that to the, uh, the headquarters, right? Because no, no, no. no. <laughs> oh, of course we always use AWIPS, right? That's, That's right. Yes, of course. But when I forecast at home on the weekend, then I'm looking at some... some <laughs> anyway. Um, well, we, you know, we, glance down here... Well, we don't want to admit that either. <laughs> no, no, we don't admit that either. That's right. No. What I noticed here is, uh, what Jim and I noticed is uh, dew point is 68 there in eastern Colorado, and this point was taken in a very similar place to this one at a very similar time. Um, you'll notice that the sounding here starts at about 850 millibars, and the sounding here starts at about 1,000 millibars. It's Colorado. Um, it, it's, this is below ground in Colorado. Only by about 5,000 feet, too. And there's not a lot of mixing below ground, and I'm not very interested in the weather down there. So, um, in, in short, uh, use caution in the higher terrain when you're using College of DuPage for your soundings, because those are not representative of the true near-ground layer. 
Um, I'm trying to make sure there isn't anything else I wanted to look at. I guess just for pretty eye candy, I may as well show this version as well in the paintballs. Again, showing this possibility here of a pretty good possibility of a strongly rotating uh, supercell in the Colorado convergent zone and then rolling off into the high plains. I like those probabilities. I like the chance of there being at least a storm or two in that area. And if I was chasing today, I'd be hauling down I-70 to get to Lyman and wait. I don't mind that Missouri area for wind today, and I do think there is that possibility. Um, where did I... You know, it's an interesting thing, though, uh, Barbara, with the you know the length of the tracks and in, in, uh, the models here. When you look at the paintball, and you can just see just tiny little splatter. Although some of the values might be almost as large as the uh, as at any one point uh, in eastern Colorado for the updraft helicity. But yeah, you know, what do you think about that? You know, with the the length of the tracks in Colorado versus you know these small length uh, tracks you see in eastern Kansas. Oh, I like it, of course. I, I, I think it at least uh, implies that there's a, a certain number of uh, model solutions that do pick up on a supercell developing and rolling off to the high plains and having time to become mature and uh, meet some higher moisture environment, perhaps. What I also really like is how packed they are. I mean, that's all generally within the space of a county of uh, distribution. To me, that's I like that confidence for this game because, like I said in the beginning, we're playing a game here, and the game is I have to get a, a storm near a point. I was going to show, last thing I'll show, and that's going to be the probability of uh, wind speed above 30 knots, given that there is some kind of a radar reflectivity. So for those who were considering something in Missouri for today, um, or in eastern Kansas, I certainly think that the guidance supports that possibility that there is the potential there for uh, a good wind to come down, and uh, I've got a forecast sounding here from that area that I had pulled up already, um, noting that there is plenty of instability in this in this profile. The shear profiles don't really impress me all that much, um, but the DK of 1,200 kind of does. So um, I don't mind that, and uh, that was my backup point if I had opted to not try for the Colorado convergence zone today. Jim, anything else that I've missed from our discussions earlier that you want to add for the sectors I looked at? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that's that's pretty good. It, it's always a consideration, you know, when you're picking a point here in this game, is uh, is the confidence? Do you go for the gold in the tornado? You know, knowing that you know at least your area of influence is going to be a bit bigger, and and I think Barbara, uh, I think your idea of going for the the Colorado scenario is pretty good because. The convection is often tied to the terrain, and you got the background set up just right, so the palmer divide can light up. And now it's just a matter of uh, all those chasers yeah. finding that one dust whirl. And we talked about that. You know, the chances that this storm is going to be heavily observed, nothing's going to get away unnoticed. Exactly. There are a lot of chasers out this week. They haven't been chasing very much, and they're going after any little chance they can get. I really feel like there's a good chance anything that would happen with that supercell would be reported well and, and perhaps even and then some. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that sounds sounds really good. I, I don't know if there's anything else, and, and uh, we do want to have uh, a chance for Dustin to uh, to weigh in on, on his forecast. So, yeah, uh, let's Dustin, go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead yeah. and hand it to you, Dustin. Okay. Sounds good. And Dustin, you know, it, you can say your your point. I don't know if you picked any of those two points, but um, you know we're certainly willing to to see what your angle is on on your decision making today. Sure, sure. So uh, yeah, I basically um, I, I kind of start out just kind of looking uh, at the surface um, using WPC or something else, uh, just to give me an idea of where the boundaries are setting up for the day, uh, just to get a feel for that. Um, and uh, like you guys have already been talking about, you know, we have this sort of uh, ring of fire thing going on here, a more summertime-like pattern uh, setting up across much of the U.S. And so, um, but I, I opted to go out in Oklahoma near to the dry line and a low pressure system out there. Um, and you guys talk about the game here a little bit too. And I, I did kind of try to play the game a little bit. I, I went early last night, so I didn't. Didn't feel like changing today, even though I thought about it um, and keeping that 15-point uh, bonus 
that I get for uh, going in early. So, uh, so again, like you guys said, it's a game uh, to, to play. But I, but I did like the fact that we did have a dry line out here uh, this afternoon. And uh, I, I kind of went more um, in kind of the, the uh, north central or maybe a little bit further uh, west. Um, um, on the map there. Uh, something I like to use is this uh, SIPS analog deterministic model guidance page. Uh, the reason I like to use it is because, you know, you, you guys kind of uh, give us the ability to be almost like an SPC forecaster, and this one's uh, really no, uh, no frills or anything like that, but um, it, it just gives you just kind of a basic overview of the entire country. Um, and so some of the things that I looked at um, even last night was just kind of the effective shear, uh, which does increase across that area. Um, and even like we saw yesterday, um, with these kinds of environments where you have, um, you know, 4,000 uh, plus K potentially, um, and then also the uh, just the uh, lapse rates uh, at, at such a high um, amount that it just, you know, you've got an environment conducive for um, some pretty uh, big storms out in uh, parts of the plain. So, so I did. I did actually play hail in this case, um, just because I'm like Barbara uh, or Barb um, that I, I like to play um, just the uh, hail, especially out west, because I just figure I'm going to have the better chance of scoring a significant report uh, versus man the, the the 75. That's a tough one to get. Um, so so again, playing the game a little bit there as well with that. Um, you can see um, again mid level lapse rates uh, really do uh, increase across. Uh, much of uh, much of that area, um, they're uh, they're not you know they're not overly excessive, but I felt like enough uh, to give you an environment that's going to be conducive of it. Looking at some of the parameters, though, there are some concerns. Like um, uh, Barb had said earlier, you can kind of see where this kind of low pressure is um, in the uh, Nam Nest. There, it does look like convection fires up pretty fast here. Um, the question is, is how quickly does it kind of uh, become kind of more uh, a larger multi-cell storms? I still think that I got a chance of getting uh, some large hail out of that um, either way, because we kind of saw a lot of those storms yesterday kind of growing into multi-cells too, um, like you guys talked about. Uh, but it, but again, I just I felt like you know the hail chance was pretty strong um, in this area, even though you do have you know pretty big outflow out there, um, even in uh, parts of. Um, um, southeast uh, uh, Kansas as well, uh, but it just kind of felt like, man, this this is probably a decent place to play at least last night. Um, you can kind of see some of the soundings here. Um, you can see that it, even even if you know, like uh, Barb said, there is the chance of uh, seeing, of course, the wind threat uh, with those D capes you know, above a thousand. Uh, but one of the other things that I like to look at too is some of these SARS. Uh, it's always kind of interesting to see if you are getting any of those reports kind of inside of even where you're kind of going. Uh, are you getting uh, similar soundings that you, you know, maybe um, analogous to uh, something that's happened in the past? So uh, that's one of the things I look at as well uh, just on these pages. I'm glad you guys brought that other thing to light because I didn't actually, uh, I didn't realize that that was an issue um, out there in the uh, in the high plains, but that's certainly something that um, I'll be looking at in the future. Um, again, the shear's not great, but I think like yesterday, um, the shear wasn't you know overly impressive yesterday, and we had reports of three inch hail just just due to the environment. Um, now I'm going to use the zero Z. Um, uh, the uh, href from the zero Z last night, and uh, I know we you guys have used it a ton. If if you're not using this, this thing is <laughs> this thing is pretty uh, this thing is pretty great because you can even go back and look at past events and and see how well this did, and and it really does a good job uh, of kind of showing you some of the threat areas. Um, you can see that that uh, the area over in Colorado that that Barb was talking about it shows up even last night, uh, but also my area is showing up a little bit down here as well. Um, I do look at this just to kind of see is there going to be more organized convection and kind of where is that going to be. Um, I usually use uh, the uh, 75 here um, as well just to kind of give me a feel uh, for that. And this area still does light up. I might be kind of on the um, on the uh, kind of on the boundary of this, um, but uh, pretty close to the area. Um, you can see they didn't quite light up as much over here in Colorado yesterday, a little more down here. I think that's why I leaned a little more towards uh, Oklahoma last night, uh, just because uh, the HRF is almost kind of like a nudger uh, for me, uh, if you will. Um, then I also do look at the members just to kind of see how how is everything going to evolve, uh, how is the convection going to evolve over time, um, and um, 
And the only thing that did concern me, like I said, was kind of some of these uh, models, like she said, are a little inconsistent on where things are going to fire up and, and kind of what the storm mode is going to be, too. Uh, so it was a concern for me last night as well, but um, just kind of took a chance uh, on that area. Um, just getting the initial storm to fire up and maybe um, give me a large hail report. So that's just kind of that's just kind of my quick and dirty uh, analysis there, uh, Jim and Barb, of just how I kind of go through it. I looked through a few more things on the SIPs, but I really like that SIPs because it has a lot of the stuff you guys have um, in that um, that guide on the uh, on the website here. That that helpful resources guide. Um, it has a lot of that stuff in there, so um, it's kind of a nice uh, tool to, to use. I don't know if you guys have used that SIPS uh, analog deterministic page or not, but no, and and, and that's something that I guess it should use more often, which I think is a good angle on on this because, um, yeah, like you say, it is really helpful to see about uh, pattern recognition of how how relevant is this one compared to past events that might have uh, uh, produced severe weather. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I mean, have you used the deterministic model page, you guys? Either, um, yeah, just yeah, deterministic perspective. I, I just like it because it gives you an overview, I guess. You know, exactly. Yeah, so I think it is really useful. I mean, you know, the one thing that that I could see, and I can see why it's important to have this because you have many of the same parameters that you would normally look at, uh, especially with the uh, the SPC meso uh, uh, plots, where you know you are looking at similar graphics, similar look and feel. Uh, throughout right. the time, yep. so yeah, yep. I definitely agree. That that would be really good. Yep. Um, so yeah, the the one thing though, which is, and this is always a a tough thing for me, is to figure out, you know, when when do I have to disembark from the ingredients based approach and think about uh, past analogs? Because uh, you know, do, does the ingredients based approach always work? You know, let's say if you had a as good a forecast as you could get, you still are going to miss something about that event uh, that may not either resolve itself or or some other reason. And so sometimes you do have to draw back to to a recollection of of past events. And, and so how do you do that? You know, except by by looking at you know some kind of objective analog. So at sure. this point here, uh, yeah, I think you know on a day like this. You've seen three different points, and, and Justin, uh, I could see your point there. You know, boy, if I if I picked always a, a Western Oklahoma, I could probably score on a, on an event like today. Definitely, I think there's certainly uh, with those kinds of steep lapse rates and, and large Cape, there's going to be severe winds. That's for sure. And like, sure, uh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Another thing, uh, just a shout out uh, to our uh, team um, here, Jackson. Um, you know, one of the things we do too, as well. Um, just um, we we have a Facebook Messenger group that we talk on. We kind of talk about our forecast through. Um, you know, we've we've set up a website here with kind of some of these uh, model pages and things like that, similar uh, to the stuff you guys have. You know, we just talk about it here at work too, and so. Uh, we do spend some time, you know, uh, kind of talking about it as a team and kind of, you know, like you guys said, it is a game. So we do try to, you know, spread out our points and, and, and play the game a little bit too. So, <laughs> Yeah, speaking of, there's, yeah, there's a lot to uh, to play on this, um, especially if you think about the non-meteorological aspects of it, which sure. uh, is, is, yeah, if we, if we did this uh, completely fairly, you know, we could actually use a, you know, instead of the reports, just go with some pseudo report, like the 24 hour track of MRMS uh, mesh, for example, the hail size or something else. But uh, some people would say, well, how do you really know that that mesh is actually what hit the ground? And yeah, the answer is no, we don't. So we do have to right. go with what it seems like it underestimates a little bit in some cases. Uh, has that been your experience or? Yeah, you know, in, in a lot of cases, uh, we've seen that too with the, with the mesh, especially when you have that uh, the really high shear convection, and and less moving supercells tend to produce much larger hail than what the mesh shows. Uh, and I know there's a couple of other cases where we've seen uh, the B were, you know, because the mesh integrates vertically and, and not from the peak reflectivity at each elevation. It uh, it tends to um, wash out when you have a beaver 
and suddenly it underestimates there. You see this big donut hole in uh, mesh, you know, right in the middle, and that's kind of like a, a big flag saying this storm is uh, probably not is, is producing bigger hail than what the mesh algorithm is saying. So, anyway, at this point here, I don't know if there are any questions. I haven't seen any questions pop up, but uh, if uh, if you do have a question or anything like that, we'll hang around here for an extra few minutes. Uh, one thing I wanted to pull up was was yesterday's. Uh, results page here, and I see most people really hammered uh, Western Oklahoma, but you see, just like today, it's a similar risk area. Lots of points scattered across the uh, the ring of fire, so to speak. Hey, Jim, we and, can't see you. I'm sorry. Let me go ahead. I knew I was doing something wrong here. Let me go ahead and uh, stick me on standby for a second. Okay, now everybody should be able to see this. So everywhere from uh, the mid-Atlantic and southwestern Pennsylvania, it looks like a few of you uh, got some points there, and uh, those extend off to the west. I think there's a few others that uh, hit pretty well, a couple wind dobs out in southeast Ohio, and then the area of enhanced or more enhanced risk. I mean, this is really not dramatic risk. There are only a few wind observations, mostly in in uh, Illinois on the south end of the risk area. Yeah, the points seem to be scattered off a little bit more to the north, uh, but a few few folks got uh, managed to get in the vicinity of, of these as well. Is that early convection, Jim? Just out of curiosity. I don't know. This one up here, I haven't actually looked. Uh, I don't know. Barbara, have you noticed whether it was uh, early convection? There's one way I can take a look at it. I can always go back in the archives and see what it is. Jim, but, you can click uh, right on that report. Go ahead. I'll tell you. There we go. I'm getting it right here. There it is. I just wondered if maybe it was before the uh, challenge started, maybe why somebody did. Yeah, it looks like mid-afternoon. It is after after uh, the start of the challenge period, which was 19C. So it looks pretty good. Yeah, I think that was regular old afternoon convection out there. Yeah. I mean, if I pulled up uh, yesterday's odds, I can see that. Let me go. Let me go to yesterday. And what up here? And I think yes, sir. There's the storms right there. It's just going through again. Let me go ahead and cycle back. And you can see I'm passing through. So it's a fairly small MCS, uh, almost like a, a little forward propagating multi-cell event. And let me go. What you can see it right there. And again, red, you know, riding the gradient between the, uh, the really hot elevated mix layer and uh, off points off to the north. Yep. So that one looks out pretty good. All right. Looks like we got a few questions here, and let's see. We got a question here. I want to see if I can uh, unmute you, David. Let's see if you can hear from you. You want to go ahead and ask your question. David Noble. There. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. Yeah, I was just curious uh, uh, why you guys like to use the uh, SIPS uh, model guidance page versus other pages like College DuPage. Is there like further analog information that you find? And that I've actually never used that uh, page before. Yeah, Dustin, I, I think you want me to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I can, I can. Well, I, I just like it uh, for an overview. Um, I just, uh, it's just, it's, and it's got some of the same things. Like I think Jim mentioned this. Uh, it looks very similar to like the a mesoanalysis page or something like that. Um, I, I don't think. I mean, I use this in in tandem with some of the other uh, model data pages because some of the other model data pages, you know, you can you can throw down a a um, you know a sounding anywhere you want to, and it's very uh, intuitive that way. Um, I just like it for a quick overview for myself because um, you can pull up like uh, MU Cape and um, and kind of the uh, effective uh, um, um, shear and those kinds of things up together. Um, so that's that's the only reason I, I like it is just as a quick overview when I'm kind of going through my forecast process. That's what I would say. Cool. Thanks. Sure thing. Thanks, David. 
Uh, let's see. I got another question here. And uh, Melody Levin actually says, thank you very much for uh, spending the time to do this webinar. And, and, and I do appreciate that. Uh, this is the first time we've actually done this. And, uh, you know, usually we do the, the, the webinars for the, the WOC students, the, you know, the one Ops course students. And we do this uh, weekly. We actually make them attend. But this time we thought, well, you know, it might be a, interesting to add a personal touch to the NWS-wide version of the challenge. And, and so hopefully if you all like this and the way it's going, uh, it certainly will motivate us to, uh, to keep it going. And, Thank uh, you, Melody, for being on the line. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, here's another one here. Let's see. Clinton Rocky says, when placing a point, uh, do you uh, – Clinton, you know what? In fact, instead of me paraphrasing, let me see if we can hear you since you're on the microphone. And, and Clinton, you might want to go ahead and just ask your question direct. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Because I wasn't on the phone with the mosquito. I didn't know if this thing worked this morning. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've been kind of challenged as far as, far as where to put points, whether I aim for – a point that would cover in between cities to get a better potential of getting reporters or, or ports, or to go closer to a highway, uh, especially in the high plains where you don't have a lot of, you know, don't know where the best places to go basically are. So I'm often kind of, like yesterday, I had a high a point uh, out in southwest Oklahoma, but later on another person came by and said, you know, there's really no one out there, so you're going to be pretty much hard pressed to get a report in that area and someone's driving by on the highway. So I'm often curious, how do you, what's the best practice for, for putting some of these points out in the high plains? Hi, Clinton. Uh, Good question. Yeah, Barbara, <laughs> go ahead. You might as well go ahead and spill your guts. And right. See. I don't know, I know if I I'm giving all my trade secrets, although given my ranking, I don't know if I'm giving much away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing top 15. That's not too bad, but it's, it's not where I want to be. Um, right, that's in the severe challenge, by the way, the smaller pool. So, it makes it. yes, the answer to your question is yes. For me, at least, I always make my decision first meteorologically, and if there was nothing else in the boundaries on the map, where would I put my points? But when it comes to actually, you know, throw that point down, uh, you bet I might shift it a few miles this way so I'm on a highway, a few miles that way so that um, I put two cities in my circle instead of one. Um, I, I do take those factors into consideration when I'm when I'm trying to consider where to put the point down. I, I try to not let it skew me too far, but um, I'm also just by living in this region for the last decade plus. You know, I'm aware of some areas where even if there's severe weather, it's hard for us to get a point. I'm also aware of some others that look bleak, but for whatever reason, they produce observations. So um, sometimes the map is deceiving, and it doesn't always tell you. Uh, for example. Um, and I'm actually going to call this one out. So if there's anybody from North Platte on the line, please jump in and talk. You would think you'd get nothing in the sand, sand hills of Cherry County up in northern Nebraska. But I think there are, I don't know, 15 ranches in that county, and all of them must be observers because they can always come up with reports up there. <laughs> so I, I don't worry about putting a point in Cherry County because there's a pretty good chance that somebody can report it. Um, so when it comes right down to it, yes, uh, I definitely factor both in. Um, I try to keep my points close to roads if I can or close to a, a town if I can see one. Um, if I know the place even more specifically and, and can narrow down further, I might. Um, if I'm thinking wind, I might center on, a, on a, an airport where there's an ASOS or an AWOS. So there's a measurement, you know, things like that. Yeah. I, I have had better luck with putting wind reports near Air Force bases or, or airports. They're more likely to get a good report off the machines perhaps. Yeah. Also, don't forget about uh, mesonets, too. Ex absolutely. You know, they're getting an awful lot of those, too, especially in West Texas. Right, exactly. And, and another thing I would add to Barbara, or to Barb's, uh, sorry, I keep on calling you formally, but uh, I would also add that um, um, she makes a good point of putting it right in a city. I've actually seen this, uh, um, people who put them right in the city, um, you know, if somebody goes to put in an LSR, uh, they might just go for the city rather than trying to put in a specific point. So that's something to keep in mind, too. Ah, tricky. Um, Jacob Bird chimed in on chat and said, I always put my points near population centers. <laughs> Lots of things, I'm sure. It's, it's that non-meteorological factor. I can't, get, you know, I can't go away from it. And I'll tell you, later on, uh, especially when we get these early systems out in the Intermountain West, you know, we're talking Nevada, folks. And 
there are three highways in there, and that's it. And I think one of them is where they filmed the movie Tremors. So, you know, <laughs> people are there. Uh, yeah, that's a, an interesting point. I was looking at this map here and just looking at the layout of the, of the points versus uh, everybody's forecast. And see how everybody's forecast is, is gravitating towards the highways. In fact, let me go back to the road view and so you can see it a little bit more easily. And in fact, uh, some of the points, there was a pretty healthy storm down here west of Childress, and you can see that the points are lining up right on 287 or not too far off, although I see one hail report that's off. And this one here, I don't think there's a hail report there. I mean, that's hard-pressed unless somebody has a ranch right on the road. No, there's nobody that's living in the middle of the North Fork of the Red River. I don't think that's happening. So we have an error at this point uh, somewhere, which I think – is because it's an estimate. It's 11 west of Estelin. Uh But then again, you know, there's the report. It's going to count if you wanted to put your ob right in the middle of that river. But I wouldn't trust uh, and depend on that all the time. That's for sure. I would say moral of the story is a, a good message to take back to your offices is to be cognizant of their LSRs. And be, sh uh, be sure to check MPing and all of the sources. Mesonets, places that don't pop right into our AOPs automatically, but you know, are good sources of reports. Because you know what? We're all depending on it for our points. Yeah. And, and the public. Exactly. So, so Clinton, <laughs> uh, uh, does that help anything? Or, um, oh, yeah. It actually kind of confirms what I was thinking. Okay, that sounds good. Because Thanks. we don't want to give you bad information or anything like that. So anybody <laughs> is welcome to go ahead and say, hey, you know, I think you're off base. We had one last chime in here that said meteorology first, geography second from Adam, but Adam Futterman. Yeah, so I would agree. I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be, um, you've got to have the intersection between the two. And if there's a severe weather area that's, I have a choice between Nevada and somewhere in Illinois, I'm going to pick Illinois because I know at least I'm going to get better coverage. So let's see. I also have something here uh, just for uh, today, just one last thing. This is today's forecast. And, Barbara, it looks like you're not alone. Yay! I, Look at all the I don't which, I'm not even going to try to guess which one of those points is yours. So It's a red one. I went tornado out there. That's all I know. A whole bunch of other people. So that – and you can see everybody wants to go with, well, where's the best intersection between the supercell and the highway? And, of course, near Lyman is the best place. But west-northwest of Lyman to Kiowa is a road that chasers like to take. And is that one to the north. Uh -huh. They're not my last chance. Exactly. Wow, and, there. yeah, you drill in, and there are, there are gravel roads and other roads in here and places that, uh, that people manage to wedge themselves in. Uh, when it's chaser country and you've got a whole bunch of chasers that are probably going after the one storm in a desperately quiet season, uh, there's going to be coverage here. It tends to be that uh, if there are relatively few chasers, you probably won't see too many sampling the hail because uh, most of us still like to keep our cars intact. But <laughs> there's that other uh, cadre of people that just go in. They don't care. And... And I know a few of them. You and get a cage, they, Jim. <laughs> they like golf balls. They like golf ball shaped cars. You know, they say, well, the, the, the air flows better over a, a, a dimpled surface than a, than a smooth one. So, yeah. But you can see, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see reports off the, uh, the main roads here uh, because people are that desperate. Further east, though, that might be a different story. But, you know, in the east, there are so many people. And, uh, so many that we're bound to get them, and uh, the trees will fall at wind speeds less than 50 knots, that's for sure, and they'll be reported. So I think I'm pretty confident as long as we have storms here, we're going to get reports. And you see the mid-Atlantic region, it's like a century. Boy, if we did a density plot, uh, that might be pretty revealing as far as what a consensus forecast might be, weighted, of course, by where reports are likely. So... Anyway, um, I think there's uh, one more question here. It's uh, Adam. I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic on. Yeah. I think, I think what I was saying is, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I think what I was saying is just when you zoom in, you, you, you're looking at the natural color, the satellite scheme, 
you know, you're at the end, because like you were talking about on the Red River and everything, you know, I think that really gives you the, the final answer there. Uh, and you, we have the natural color uh, available. It, it seems obvious. To maybe it seems obvious, or maybe it's not. I don't know to say that, but I guess it's, it's, it's really helpful, in my opinion, when I look at a point uh, to make my final decision. Anyway, that's just what I'm Yeah, about. yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's a lot of useful things you can get out of this. The natural uh, color, yeah. See if there are actually people there, yeah, uh, ranchers, farmers, right. and so forth. So, yep. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it would be nice to have, you know what would be a good site, actually, if you ever go on the Weather and Hazards Viewer, and you look at the okay. points, and you, you can select your network. Uh, we know that the network, you know, the ASOS, the FA, the AWOS, and so forth, probably have the best exposure. You're most likely going to get an observed wind that's, that matches what you expect. You know, whereas maybe the co-ops or the school nets and so forth, you know, the anemometers are poorly sighted. But, yeah, that over a satellite image background probably would be, uh, would be handy. That, that's great. Okay, thanks, Jim. That's what I wanted to add tonight. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the advice, Adam. Okay. Let's see. Any other questions or comments? Um, if not, uh, I'll give it a I'll give it a once, twice, and three times, and then uh, we'll go ahead and close up here. Now, if you guys, uh, if you all like this kind of format for. Uh, a debrief uh, discussion and so forth. Just let us know uh, if you have any suggestions or anything like that that you want to add. Uh, certainly, you're welcome to contact us uh, and bring it back to us, and then uh, you know see what we can do for the next time around. Uh, we do this. We thought we might do this kind of format, and we're always looking for guests. Uh, if you want to add another session, we're certainly welcome. We can do that. We've got some time, I think. Right? And All kinds of time. Absolutely. So if there's there's any uh, anybody, if you want to go ahead, I think we have somebody lined up for next time, uh, but we can schedule another another webinar and, and announce and, uh, and and pull it up. So we're pretty flexible on our end as to uh, how many you want uh, to a certain extent. Okay, you know maybe not every day, but you know to uh, you know once a week. I think we could pull off a once a week kind of thing. Uh, Jim, if I could just jump in real quick. Um, sure. Just, just so everybody knows, you probably noticed the website hasn't updated since Friday. Um, once again, we've had some problems pushing updates. Uh, I've got to call at 1 o'clock to try and get that straightened out, so hopefully we can get the, the site updated on a regular basis again. Um, so apologies on that. We'll hopefully get that cleared up so you can actually look at the, the maps that Jim showed and look at your forecast again soon. Yep. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, we have some things that sometimes get out of our control, and uh, so we we try try to keep this live uh, despite the efforts of uh, of others. So, in the meantime, I think we'll go ahead and close. And I do want to thank uh, Barb Mays and definitely Dustin for uh, for uh, participating in this. And Dustin, I do thank you very much for being a guinea pig as the guest on here. I'd like to have a guest for every sure. one of our webinars that comes. Sure, out. it was a lot of fun, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that worked out pretty well. So uh, next time we'll go ahead. Uh, if we do other webinars that we have not scheduled yet, I know we have one for June 7th, but we can add another. Uh, by popular request, we can go ahead and do that, and we'll let you know uh, when that might be. And it might even be before June 7th, who knows. So in the meantime, uh, good luck on your forecasting, and uh, we'll talk again at some point. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Thanks very you. much.